Let's bow for a word of prayer. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, and use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Amen. You know, it's funny that I know less about preaching today than I knew 15 years ago when I moved here. I think that my best preaching happened in my first few years here when I was just out of seminary and I came here with a chip on my shoulder with a mission to prove myself to all of you and I'm confident that I was in complete control. But I also remember that last year when I was at Walnut Grove, my last church before I served here, that I stood in the back of the Walnut Grove Church to greet after worship and Tom McGrew, God bless him, was next in line. And instead of a handshake, he put his arm around me and he said, Preacher, you know that baseball players don't hit a home run every at bat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Tom, I understand that. But what does that have to do with church? Well, preacher, you don't have to hit a home run every Sunday. I was quite confused. I needed to press further. I, Tom, I, I don't think we have a church softball team. Again with his arm around me. And an ever so loving hug. Preacher, some Sundays your sermon is a home run. And other Sundays, not so much. <laughs> Today, not so much. I have no idea where you were going with this sermon, preacher. Now, to his credit, the very next Sunday, he came out of church, put his arm around me, said, preacher, now that's a home run. <laughs> but in those years after, and I, when I moved here, I, I, could, I would always swing for the fences every Sunday and confidently stride back to the back of the room each Sunday to await your words of commendation because my sermon touched your heart, jogged your brain, or connected right where you were in life. But after 18 years of preaching over 900 sermons and standing in the back of the room every Sunday shaking hands, I know even less about preaching. Why does a sermon work that has no reason for working? Or why does a sermon not work when it's got everything going for it? I don't know. I mean, I'll be in the middle of a sermon some Sunday and it's a great sermon on which I have worked hard. There, are, there I am preaching and preaching and I look out at the congregation and nothing. My bad jokes, well, I thought they were good jokes. My jokes are met with blank stares. The fire and passion in my voice is met with heads nodding off to sleep. My moments of near tears, and I want to make eye contact with you to share my tear with you. And there you are looking at your phone. And you meet me in the back of the room with a Good morning, or nice speech, and I know I didn't connect with you. Why did I want to preach this sermon? What did I have in mind? Some, sometimes sermons backfire. They roll over and play dead. They limp off to obscurity, Mr. the mark. But maybe even worse, sometimes they work and I don't know why. I mean, I have a busy week and I'm with the youth on ASP or on a Juarez mission trip, a, a wedding and a funeral in the same week, my own kids' activities. Saturday night, I'm down at the hospital trying to catch up on my visiting that I intended to get to that sermon earlier in the week, but I never get to a sermon early in the week. Let me lie to you there. But there's nothing to do but stand and do what I can. So I tell you a story about Gelsberg, or I make an old person joke about Doug and make a reference to the Cubs. And then I remind you that you're the hands of Christ and I talk about community and what it means to us. And then I pray and I tell those stories that you've never been to church before because I didn't want you to hear those, those stories again. And then I stagger to the end of my sermon, I limp off with a poem or a nice little antidote, and I pray for that closing song to rescue me from my embarrassment. And what happens on those Sundays? When the service is over, I'm standing at the door, and I remember Tom McGrew saying, hey, you didn't hit a home run. And I think to myself, for what you pay me here, you should get at least 12 good sermons a year. That should be enough.
But then it happens. You come out, tear in your eyes, preacher. Thank you. Thank you, I needed that. Another comes out and says, preacher, thank you. I, I'm going in for surgery tomorrow and that, after that sermon, I'm ready. What happened? It worked. Why, why did it work? Wait a minute, Joe, Sarah, c- come back in here. What is it that you heard? I go back over my notes after church, the ones I scribbled on the back of an envelope while I was watching TV last night, and there's nothing there. What happened? So we come in here each morning with all kinds of questions rumbling around in our minds, some intellectual curiosity, I hope, and perhaps a secret or even a public longing to meet and know more deeply this one that we call Jesus Christ. And the questioners who went to Jesus throughout Scripture always got what they bargained for, more than what they bargained for in Scripture. If you're looking for a simple yes and no unambiguous answer, you don't get that. The answers always seem ambiguous. There's always a subtext in Scripture. There's always another way of viewing it. And if you get locked in too quickly, you'll miss it. There's always more going on than meets the eye. But such is the nature of faith. Such is the encounter with the one that we call Jesus Christ. You always get more than what you bargain for when you encounter Him. The answers we seek may attempt to set an agenda for what we expect when we walk in the door here. But the things that we try to bury, the deep longing inside, the grief that we carry, the anxiety, the past choices that, that we may have, sought, that may have sought to define us, they always have their way of being found by Christ in these spiritual moments. Today we're looking inwards as a part of our sermon series on directions. I call this Directions 2.0. As I told you before, I preached a whole sermon series in 2006 when we were going through pastor transitions and we were moving into this new facility. Well, nine years later, we're revisiting this subject because we're at it again, standing at a crossroads with transition in our pastoral leadership. And over these last six weeks, my hope, the last six, six weeks together, my hope is that we can look at the many directions that we have offered to us when we stand at a crossroads, like the picture it's on your bulletin on the screen. That before we move forwards in transition, we need to sharpen our own identity and who we are. Before we can go forwards, we will look backwards, upwards, inwards. Last week we talked about withwards. Today, before we go forwards, we look inwards. And see, for most of us, there is this Grand Canyon-sized gap between who we are meant to be and the who we have become. Much of our faith journey, when we examine our souls, when we look inwards, becomes an attempt to minimize that gap. We come to church seeking answers. Shoot, we, we, we turn to self-help books looking for direction. But we keep looking. Just ask Nicodemus, who went with a simple inquiry to Jesus, so we think. But really out of a deeper motivation within. Who knows for sure, but he at least had an intellectual curiosity about the signs that Jesus had performed, which raised questions about Jesus' own identity. It is his story that was read earlier in this worship service from John chapter 3. We looked at the scripture three months ago during Lent, but we're going to take another hard look at it this morning. So we're going to join the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. We might get more than we bargained for than when we came to worship this morning. We might just encounter Jesus on a deeper level because we can be sure that he will always push us or woo us or challenge us to go deeper and broader in our own inward reflection. So Nicodemus approaches Jesus with an underlying question, or not really a question. He's observed the signs and apparently he wants to know a little more about this one who is performing these signs. So he approaches Jesus. Maybe he's silently longing for an encounter with God. Who is this Nicodemus? No, Doug, it's not the gum that you use to stop smoking. Nicodemus is a person in Scripture. He's educated like we are. He's prominent. He's successful like we are. He's experienced, maybe my age or your age. He's a person of more than adequate financial means. He's well-known. He's an interpreter and adjudicator of the Torah and the tradition. He's one who has, say, a significant level of control both over his own life and the lives of others. He has put his life together in a way that has worked for him. Life is good for Nicodemus, apparently. He's secure, he's old, and at least he identifies himself as such. 
when he says to Jesus, he asks Jesus, how can a person who is old be born again? I'm asking that same question as I approach 40 years old this year. How can a person who is old be born again? But what that means is he has more memories than dreams. He's got more reflections on ministry than anticipations in ministry. He can draw on his broad and deep experience and rely on it entirely if he so chooses. I mean, do you identify with him at all? Most of us are privileged. We've got life under control pretty much. So life is good. Nicodemus is a part of the privileged class. He is recognized in public. He's a public person, but he comes by night. Why does he choose to come by night? Why does he come to see Jesus at night? Some would suggest because he's afraid, but I doubt that. When you read on in John's gospel, you realize that when all the Jesus disciples left him at the crucifixion, Nicodemus was there, so he wasn't afraid. Perhaps he wants a private conversation with Jesus, perhaps. But what stands out to me in this text is that he comes to Jesus with his doubts in the cover of night. He comes alone. He's still got a lot of shadows in his own life. He doesn't have it all together as much as people think he has it together. But he comes alone in the darkness. See, we don't. We don't do that. We come here on a bright and beautiful, okay, most Sundays are bright and beautiful. So we come here on a bright and beautiful Sunday morning. We come dressed at times so people will notice. We may be prominent, knowledgeable, successful, confident. But we come seeking Christ and his answers to our questions. But we come together. Back to our story in this conversation. Suddenly the theological discussion moves into deep waters. It moves from the head to the heart, if you will. Beyond talking about miracles and signs to a whole new order of things, I'm introducing you, Nicodemus, to something that transcends your curiosity. You've come asking for a sign to help you control life more, perhaps, or to validate what you already know. I want to put you in touch with a whole new world. I want to turn your world upside down to where you see reality as it really should be seen. It's a world totally out of your control. He says, you've got to be born from above to enter into that world. Now this text from John chapter 3 has been used and overused and abused throughout the years. As, and folks have used it as the necessary path to the kingdom. They often speak the way Nicodemus has misunderstood it. They say you must be born again. Like a second time or something. But Jesus didn't say that in scripture. He said you must be born from above. Flesh is flesh. Spirit is spirit. What God wants to do with you is a renovation involving an attic to basement overhaul. Top to bottom. Anothen. The Greek word is anothen. Say that with me. Anothen. It means from above, from top to bottom. The only other time this word is used in scripture is on Good Friday when the, tor when the veil was torn at the temple. From top to bottom. A complete overhaul. Nicodemus, you've got to be born from above. From top to down from top to bottom. So Jesus confronts them with this whole new possibility. And what it requires is a radical reorientation of life without which we will misinterpret and we will miss the answers Jesus seeks to meet with us. When we come as knowledgeable and as, as confident as we are at times, if we don't have this openness, this new birth within us, this rebirth, this, this sense of being made new, we miss an opportunity for God to be at work when we come with our agenda. You can't see it unless you are born a nothing from above. It is a matter of seeing the possible in the impossible. Turning water into wine. Opening the eyes of the blind. Making the lame to walk. All these things that Jesus was doing. It's not just about that surface level miracle. But it's about what's going on underneath for people, bringing people in, bringing people into a community of love and grace. And then Jesus will continue to in his preaching as well. He'll continue to turn things upside down. He says you want to be the first, you have to be the... You want to be the greatest, you have to be the servant. You want to save your life, you have to lose it. See, this re radical reorientation of life because when we put aside our agenda and everything we think we know about life and how it works and the things we expect Jesus to tell us. And when we approach Christ thinking we know what we want, God has another message and another answer in store for us. But we have to allow God to be God. See, so there's this message that Christ leaves us here. 
in verse 8. Not, you know John 3.16, for God so loved the world, God gave his only blotted son, blah, 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 blah. You see it in football stadiums and all that. But John 3.8, Jesus tells Nicodemus this. The wind blows where it chooses. The Greek word here is pneuma. It means spirit. The spirit of God. God's spirit. Not just the wind blows where it chooses. God's spirit blows where it chooses. See, it's Jesus telling us that it's just something God does in us. But the challenge is that we are born from top to bottom, allowing the kingdom of heaven and the way of the spirit to move in and through us. Are we open to be moved in ways that we never thought possible when we can let go of our own agenda? See, whether that be in a sermon and you believe in and hearing the things I want you to hear, the deepest places that we didn't want exposed to God, God comes and touches us. Or even in our own determination, deciding my own fate of where I want my career to take me. Sometimes I have to let go and let God's radical reversal say, hmm, I got you, but you got to let go. We have to believe that God has our best intentions at the forefront of where his spirit's blowing spirit moves us. Each of these sermons have ended with a wonderful statement about faith church that have come from your words that you guys have shared with me through the years. Faith UMC is a church that lives inwards. With all the ways we seek to go, with all the control that we seek to hold based on our success, our privilege, our education, and wealth, these outward factors mean nothing when God is at work in us. Forming us into a community not defined by what's on the outside, but what's on the inside. To be a part of Faith United Methodist Church is to embrace a kingdom upside down from the rest of the world where we are open to where God might lead us, whether it be in the deepest places of our souls or the darkest streets of humanity. Whatever way it is, it is trusting that God's leading will not only draw us closer to one another, but draw us closer to our faith in the one who births us from top to bottom. Are we able to let go and let God? Today, we go, before we go forwards, we go inwards. In Jesus' name, amen.